Here are three fantastic horror novels that every single fan of horror fiction should be checking out right now. And honestly, even if you're not a big horror fan, at least one of these might appeal to you. I can't stand when people bury the lead in YouTube videos, so I'm gonna jump right in with the one that I think is most interesting. This is The Ha by David Sodergren. David Sodergren is awesome. He is a neurodiverse, self-published horror author based here in Scotland. I recently became a huge David Sodergren fan with this, Maggie's Grave, a wonderful piece of grotesque pulp horror. But The Ha is often considered by fans to be his best work. And it really is something special, primarily because it is both a very intense folk horror novel and a kind of love story, a really touching and unique one. Something I really, really adore about David Sodergren is the fact that he's such a grassroots writer. He self-publishes all of his books through Amazon. He built a following and self-promotes just on social media, and he's done really, really well out of it. He's built a dedicated following of fans, and now I'm one of them. And The Ha is a 200 page horror novel that takes place in the modern day in a small fishing village on the coast of Scotland, a place all but forgotten. The village is called Witchhaven, and unusually, our protagonist is an elderly woman in her 80s. Muriel Macaulay has lived in Witchhaven all her life. 12 years ago, her husband, a fisherman, was lost at sea, never to be seen again. And now, this quiet, unassuming, peaceful fishing village, with a strong sense of community and an elderly population, is under threat from an American billionaire who wants to raise the village entirely, destroy the coastline, Line and build a golf course. He is our main villain, and honestly, while it's not difficult to hate billionaires, after all, none of them are technically people, Sodergren still does an amazing job of making this villain the most disdainful creature you can imagine. A truly hateful, monstrous thing. And all the way through the novel, he gets progressively worse, or at least shows his true colors more and more, and you are dreaming of his death. You you cannot wait to see what horrible, awful things are going to happen to him. They have to. They must. For the good of humanity, this man must suffer. But our protagonist is an 84-year-old woman, a quiet widow who lives in a cottage. The only relative we ever hear about is a grandson who lives in London with his boyfriend. What can Muriel do? Well, lucky for her, she soon gets a little bit of help from a sea monster. The titular Ha is a fog that drifts onto land periodically from the sea. And one day, shortly after this billionaire turns up and starts causing trouble, the Ha brings with it a strange alien-like blob this fleshy sack that washes up onto the beach, and Muriel can tell that whatever it is, it is alive and it's in pain. And so she brings it home and puts it in her bathtub and tries to nurture it and help it in any way she can. Muriel is a good, kind old soul. And this sea monster is going to repay her kindness by helping her take revenge, by helping her defend her home, defend this village from a man who has bribed the local police, bribed the media, Media, paid off everybody, and is actually directly responsible for the deaths of a few people throughout the novel. He is a sinister, conniving beast of a billionaire. And in a way, this is kind of a one-on-one -on -one fight between Muriel and the billionaire. But I mentioned that this is a love story, and it is. See, Muriel's husband went missing, but this ha creature that has washed up on the beach, once it has fed on a victim or two, it is able to morph and it uses Muriel's memories to morph into the shape of her late husband. I don't want to tell you any more details than that, and I'm not going to call this a romance. I think romance and love story are different things, and this is certainly a story of love, not romance. And it's really, really beautiful, very bittersweet. The bittersweetness is not in the ending, but rather all the way through the story, there is a bittersweetness to the relationship between Muriel and this monster. A monster that commits some of the most terrifying acts of body horror I have ever read in a novel in my life. Page 75 of The Ha will stay with me for as long as I live. I read that page with my hand over my mouth and my eyes bulging. It was absolutely terrifying, and I'd say there are like four or five pages, four or five really grotesque scenes peppered throughout this novel that will leave your jaw on the floor. And the first one for me was page 75. It's not the only one, but 
because it was the first one, it's the one that's really stuck with me. There are some absolutely wild scenes of body horror, of people dying in the most grotesque and uncomfortable ways. Just a pure exercise in descriptive tension and the author's imagination. What's the most horrible way a monster could kill a person? Sodogren took up that challenge and I think he did an incredible job. If you like your stories to be original, if you like supporting independent self-published authors, if you like the idea of genres blending in interesting ways, and if you want to see just how wild a death scene can be in a book, you need to read The Ha. Then we have The House That Horror Built by Christina Henry. I really like Christina Henry, this is the second book of hers that I've read and I'm going to keep reading her more and more. But this book got a very lukewarm response when it first came out, very recently. And I think that's because only about a year beforehand, she released another book that I haven't yet read, and that book was received so, so well. That novel was a horror thriller, and it was called Good Girls Don't Die. I really, really want to read it, I'm going to soon, but after the enormous success of that book and the showers of praise that it got, this was met with eh, just a whole lot of eh from the community, but I really, really enjoyed this book, and I want to try and sell you on it. If you thought it was mid, fair enough, but I had a lot of fun with this, and the main reason for that is the mother-son dynamic. I'm not a huge fan of, um, families. I've got a stack of family trauma a mile high, but I really enjoy in my fiction when you have a good mother-child relationship. There is something warming, there is something wholesome, and there's also something kind of exciting in it, especially when it plays out in an action movie or a horror story. And that's what we have here. The house that horror built is about a 34-year-old woman named Harry. 34 happens to also be my age right now, and it's wild to me that Harry has a 14-year-old son. It makes me realize that I am part of an older generation now than I thought I was. Like, I have friends with kids, but those kids are often babies and toddlers. But I could so easily have a 14-year-old kid. A lot of people my age do, and it just kind of rattled me. I was like, oh my god, time, time moves so quickly. Wow. We are that age. Mental. Anyway, Harry is an amazing mum to her son, Gabe, and all the way through this book, Gabe was giving me Wesley Crusher energy. There's something very Wesley Crusher in this kid, and I honestly pictured him looking like Will Wheaton. Their dynamic is a lot of fun, but they are struggling. The novel is set post-pandemic. Harry is struggling for work, but she finds a job, probably a temporary one, cleaning a massive mansion in Chicago. The mansion happens to also be owned by someone that she grew up really respecting, the director of a bunch of great horror movies. This director is Javier Castillo, and Harry grew up on his films. She and her son Gabe bonded over his films. Javier Castillo's films mean a lot to her and her son, and she had no idea he lived in Chicago and that she was gonna be cleaning his house for him, and she purposefully doesn't mention the fact that she knows who he is and enjoys his films. She keeps a healthy, professional distance from him while she does her job, but this house is full of secrets. There's there's a lot of weird stuff going on, and right at the beginning, we get some of it. Harry is cleaning, and she hears a thumping noise from a room. The room is locked. She's not allowed in, she's not given a key, it's the only room that actually locks and has a keyhole, and she's often sure that she's heard whispering or moaning, some kind of noises through the walls, probably coming from that room. And if you've ever watched a horror movie or read a horror novel, your mind starts spinning with ideas. And immediately I thought, God, please let this be original. Whatever is in that room, please let it be something interesting. I don't want to be able to figure out, I don't want to be able to imagine what is in that room. And as I was reading, I was like, well, it could be this. It could be this, it could be this, this, this. I hope it's not any of that. I want it to be something wholly original and strange. And it is. It's not wholly original, but it's not something I completely guessed. It takes a lot of the ideas that I had and kind of works them together into a Frankenstein's creature of new ideas. And I was pretty impressed. I was definitely satisfied. I wasn't disappointed by the ending, by the reveal of what's in that room. And there's a lot more besides. As we continue to read, we learn more about Castillo's life and why he now lives this reclusive life here in Chicago when he was making movies in LA until a few years ago. Harry already knows that there was a controversy surrounding his son. Javier Castillo had a son who supposedly committed murder and then disappeared along with Castillo's wife. The two of them just ran, vanished into the night. And all of that shame and all of the controversy means that Castillo is hiding, or at least laying low. 
he still lives in a massive mansion full of all of his movie props and other props from different films that he's gotten his hand on, like a xenomorph puppet from Alien, for example. His house is a dedication to the horror genre, to horror cinema, and Harry loves that. So does Gabe, because eventually, Gabe and Javier will develop a kind of pseudo-father-son relationship. But Harry is worried about Gabe getting too close to this guy when he's clearly got some skeletons in his closet. What I enjoyed so much about this book wasn't the scares, but the drama of it all. The interpersonal relationships between these people. They are very well-written characters, very satisfying to read. But there are also a few moments of really chilling terror, in my opinion. For example, the most famous and successful film that Castillo ever made made was about this hellspawn demon goat man thing. It became an iconic horror movie monster and he's got the original costume. But the costume moves? Whenever Harry goes into the room that it's in to do some cleaning, she sees that its eyes are on her. Its eyes follow her. Its head starts to tilt and eventually the whole thing starts to move. And this adds another layer of mystery to this house and to Castillo himself. Not only do we have a locked room with noises coming from it, how do we also have a possessed monster movie costume? or a costume that actually has someone in it, maybe? Again, your mind starts to churn out ideas and possibilities, and you hope it's gonna be something original that takes you by surprise. You don't want to guess this. This isn't an Agatha Christie story. You want to be frightened and surprised by why the goat man thing moves and what's in the room. And one thing I really appreciated from this novel was the guts to go slow. It's a real slow burn, but it's not too long. It's 300 pages-ish. I sped through it in like two days. Even though it's a slow burn, it doesn't feel stodgy and unsatisfying and like you just want to get to the point. Because the drama propels you forward just enough, as does the mystery. But it's got a very rigid three-act structure, and when you get to the third act, you expect things to go completely nuts, and they don't. The first half of the third act is a quiet build. Tensions rise. You have no idea how things are gonna play out. But in the second half of the third act, things finally go insane. You get what you want eventually. And I was very relieved by that. I'm super impressed by the way that this novel is structured and especially with the characters and their relationships. The mother-son dynamic between Harry and Gabe is great. I love it. And I'm a little bit annoyed that other fans just didn't gel with this as much. I thought it was great. The House That Horror Built is a really solid horror novel. And finally, here's a novel by one of the most successful American horror authors writing today. The Southern Book Club's Guide to Slaying Vampires by Grady Hendrix. It's immediately a great title, and Hendrix is known for his great titles. Just here behind me you've got How to Sell a Haunted House. Down here somewhere is My Best Friend's Exorcism, and there's also The Final Girl's Support Group. These are all great titles, and I've enjoyed all of those novels. Until now, How to Sell a Haunted House was my favourite Hendrix book, but a lot of people say this is his best. Now that I've read it, I think I agree with them. It's not perfect, but no book is. However, I do think it's one of the smarter and more original and satisfying American horror novels we've had in recent years. The Southern Book Club's Guide to Slaying Vampires is set in the 90s. Our protagonists, as the title says, are a book club, a group of comfortable white suburban housewives who all live in Mount Pleasant, South Carolina. According to the introduction, that's where Hendrix himself grew up, and he was very much inspired by his own mother when writing this book. Although the title does lie just a little bit because there are not multiple vampires here. There's just the one. This is very much a Dracula tale. One deadly predatory vampire that these women have to take out. But it's not that easy. And really we only follow one of them, Patricia. She is our protagonist and she's a very likeable person. Patricia lives a very comfortable life. Her husband is a doctor, he's also an asshole, and together they've got two kids who get progressively older as the book goes on because it traces most of the 90s. When the book begins, the titular vampire moves into town. And the reason he does that is because his great aunt has just died. She was a neighbor of Patricia. And and one day, she starts behaving really strangely. She attacks Patricia, and she dies shortly after. Her behavior was kind of monstrous and scary. And after she dies, the only relation she had 
was James Harris, and he moves into her old house. And James Harris is very obviously a vampire, but that doesn't occur to anyone else because that's ridiculous. At first, James and Patricia get on really well, and she actually helps him out a little bit, helps him set up a bank account because he comes up with various excuses about how he moves around a lot. He drives a van with a Texas license plate, but tells someone else that he's been living in Vermont. Who is this guy and where is he from? Well, Patricia's a nice person, and so she gives him the benefit of the doubt. She helps him out. She drives him places in his van with tinted windows during the day. He tells her a story about a condition that he has that affects his eyes, which means he's not comfortable in daylight. And things get weirder from there, but very, very soon, kids start to go missing. But the kids that go missing are from a poor black neighborhood where the police couldn't give two sh Patricia has a cleaner, Mrs. Green, who is from this neighborhood. And Patricia's mother-in-law is currently living with them because she's slowly slipping away because of dementia or Alzheimer's. And when she sees James, she recognizes him, says that he owes her husband money. She recognizes James from decades ago when he was going by a different name, when he was someone else. But because she's got dementia, people think she's confused and he looks like someone she once knew and in her mind she's back there again, but she's not. But we know. We know that James is this guy. Of course, we know he's a vampire. But Patricia has to figure this out all by herself, and she has to try and convince the book club as well. But as soon as we get to the halfway point, something happens, something shifts, and everything becomes so much harder for Patricia to deal with. And for the entire first half, no one thinks he's a vampire. Patricia thinks he's a predator, a murderer, something dangerous, but not specifically a vampire, a very human monster. The novel isn't particularly deep and literary. It hasn't been written by a minority writer for a start. Grady Hendrix is a cishet white man who lives in Manhattan, but he does a decent job from his vantage point of tapping into and sympathizing with very enormous social issues when it comes to class and racial disparity, as well as the uselessness and the ignorance of local law enforcement, etc. The only element of him writing about this stuff that kind of rubbed me the wrong way was the fact that he writes his black characters with very black coded language. Their dialogue has a lot of African American vernacular in it. And from a white perspective, that's a little bit awkward. Or maybe it isn't, maybe I'm being too sensitive. I'm not really sure because I'm also white. But it still made me go, uh, is that, is that right? Is that, is that okay? Not really sure to be honest. But that aside, I really appreciate how Hendrix taps into the ways in which poor, vulnerable, minority ethnic communities get ignored and can often be entirely helpless, especially in the 90s. This was a time of stranger danger. This was a time when in small suburban communities, distrust was an increasingly common feeling amongst local people. Times were changing. And I think Hendrix is really good at exploring all of that and using the vampire mythology to create a predatory monster it feels very, very true to the ways that Dracula is often read and analyzed, with Dracula being a metaphor for queerness, a metaphor for immigration, and lots of other things besides. Hendrix is doing something really similar here, with James Harris being a dangerous predator, doing awful things to children and leaving them dead. It's really, really well done. Patricia is also a wonderful protagonist. Her husband is a hateful, horrible, gross, useless, misogynistic prick, and I enjoyed hating him progressively more as the novel went on. I am super impressed by the way that this novel is structured, by the way James Harris comes to life life as a despicable villain. One of the most exciting vampire monster villains that we've seen in years. When it comes to vampire fiction, this book should go down in history for its presentation of the vampire myth and the vampire as a villainous monster and a metaphor for other things and blah, blah, blah. I'm so impressed by all of this. There's a lot at play here when it comes to class dynamics and racial dynamics. It's not very deep, but it's very well done for what it is. And it's a really, really horrific grotesque horror story. There are some really, really tense, icky, horrible, terrifying moments in here, honestly. Check it out. Check all three of these books out. They're all brilliant. If you enjoyed this video and you would like to support me in making more of them, and you'd love to join an amazing community of bookworms, you can do so by supporting me at patreon.com forward slash Willow Talks Books. I would hugely, hugely appreciate your support. So thank you in advance and subscribe for books.